and we've got years of stuff. Let's pray. <laughs> Father, you alone can make these truths alive. We can understand them academically, but not spiritually. We need you to make them come alive in us and show us, lead us as a body of people into the expressing of this so that we become a literal expression of a functioning body of Christ not just a theological concept, but there comes a life, life comes, as we understand the principles and the spirit and substance of them, get into our inner being. Thank you, Father, in your precious name. Amen. So, we're going to talk tonight about the forming of both the individual and the corporate remembering that there is always a parallel to the natural in the spiritual realm. And what we've never done is drawn the parallel. So we sometimes we don't understand what we're going through because we don't understand the principles. And we rebuke the devil, and the devil doesn't go anywhere because it isn't the devil. And we rebuke the flesh, and it doesn't go anywhere because it isn't the flesh. It's the dealings and workings and formings of God. So in the beginning, it was, it was basically our spirits that were in the image of God. Remember, when man fell, he got turned inside out. The least important part of him before the fall was his human body. But when he fell, he got turned inside out. God's about to come and turn us outside in. <laughs> okay? At that time, man was clothed with spirit and with light. Since man, man's fall, God has had to take each individual that would present himself to God and shape and form their spirit into his image after their spiritual conception. Now, because of this, we must understand the difference between being conceived and being born. Our initial salvation experience is our conception. But that doesn't mean we're born again. It does mean if we die, we'll go be with Jesus. Just like a, a child who's been conceived and, and there's something happens and it goes without even coming out of the womb, it goes straight to be with Jesus. So we need to see that and understand it. God loves the innocent. And there are many today who are innocent. They're, they're not fully born because they haven't come out of that womb time, but they haven't been taught. They haven't, there hasn't been someone to care. And sometimes it's been aborted because the wombs they're born into aren't safe. This church and every church that loves God is to be a womb. When we talk of conception in our spirit, we find that there is a union between our spirit and the spirit of God. The product of this is the seed of life within our spirit. I like to use this diagram I have up in the corner here. I'm not sure that uh, they can see it online, but it's the seed. And what it, the, there are um, harvester ants, and, and they take seed, wheat seed, into their, uh, into their uh, nests or their, their hills. But they don't, they bite off the wheat germ. Otherwise, in the dampness of the earth, that seed would germinate and fill their, their uh, storage bins. But when, when we fell, the wheat germ was bit off. And when Jesus comes into our life, the wheat germ is reinserted. And you'll see this. One day I'm sitting in a service and, and this lady is crying and 
I looked down and the Lord said, tell her that she's not done anything wrong, but that the power of the seed has caused her to break through the earth or the cement. And then he said, tell her when he's when her husband's not around that he was the cement. Uh, but the power of the seed, you know, sometimes we uh, things begin to show up in our lives and it looks rotten and it looks terrible. But remember, Paul said this. He said, I count all things as what? Dumb or fertilizer. Your flesh is fertilizer for your spirit. And that's exactly what happens here in this diagram. See that? It was it, and it's the life from within that cracks the seed. So sometimes when your life cracks open and you're embarrassed or whatever, it's really the life within that's cracked the seed. It's not something from external. We've got to see that God's focus is the life in you. It's not the mess you're in. It's the life of Christ in you that is going to break loose and bring forth new life. When man was filled with spirit, spiritual realities were his first concern. He was more conscious of the spirit realm than any other. In the fall, he lost the consciousness of spirit. God must first rebirth our spirit, then from the inside out, bring us to a place where we are more aware of our spirit and its needs than any other realm. We're on that journey now. When you come to Jesus, you begin the journey. Some people stop that journey in the middle, and they're always concerned about the externals. God is concerned about the internals. When a local assembly, see we take this from the individual, that, that, that uh, point was about the individual, but when a local assembly is called of God, then God must bring them to a consciousness that the spiritual realm is preeminent or to be of preeminence. This takes time. And by the way, there are lots of distractions along the way. You know, one, one time I was studying the tabernacle and I move in, in my teaching from the outer court to the holy place and the Lord said, there's more distractions here than there is in the outer court. There's the table on the right hand, which is the word. There's the lampstand on the left hand, which is the all the things of the spirit, which are multitude. And then there's the altar of incense. And the journey... Most of us in that journey stop at one or the other. We don't get to the altar of incense where we present our bodies a living sacrifice. And by the way, some people would rather have one sacrifice and die. But we're called to be a living sacrifice and a sacrifice is offered by fire. So some of you have been wondering what you're in. You're in a continual fire. But your body is a living sacrifice. Holy and acceptable unto God, which is what? Your reasonable service. Hmm? I know it was 80 in here when we started. It's on its way down. All right. During this time, God forms the spirit or the core of an assembly. Can I say this very gently? God is in the midst of forming the core of this assembly. Because he said to me before all this started, he said, this church must be born again. And that means that the whole start has to start again, in a sense. Thank God we have more understanding now than the first time through. But God is birthing something brand new in the earth that's not been seen before. It was not seen in the early church. Not because God couldn't do it, 
but because he's reserved some things for the last days. God is going to do things in these last days that have never been done before, never been seen in the earth from creation till now. And it's to show forth his greatness. There's a, a, a phrase in scripture called the day of the Lord. And it really is the day when the Lord's greatness is manifest. Most have taught it as a day of judgment. No, it's a day when the, the glorious glory of God supersedes the enemies, all the enemy tries to do. And the Revelation uh, chapter 13 through to 18 is actually the last ditch stand of the enemy trying to bring down the kingdoms of our God. <clears throat> but in, in 11, or I think it's 10, 11, and 12, it says the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our God and of his Christ. What happens after that is that taking place. It doesn't come just because somebody snaps their fingers. It comes because God shows our, has taught our hands to war and our fingers to fight. Everything we get in the promised land, we get by warfare. Don't get so excited. All right. <laughs> to the level that the core is aware of the things of the spirit, that church will move in the spirit. You wonder why some churches have more of the anointing, more of the presence of God, more, and we do the comparative thing. But really what happens in their services is a, is a manifestation of the revelation that the core of that church has. Because out of the abundance of the heart of the church, it speaks. Again, the manifestation of the church. The manifestation of the present level of the presence of God okay. in in a service or in a church is an indication of the level of the revelation of God that that core, the core of that church has. So let's apply this a little more to the local assembly. The local assembly that God is forming goes through the same processes that a baby in the womb goes through. This analogy is referred to by Jesus when he told Nicodemus that he must be born again. Yes, there's a microphone right there. So they can hear it online. I just saw something in the spirit, and I want to make sure that I'm on my track. It says, when a human egg is fertilized by sperm, it emits a flash of light. Mm -hmm. In the spirit realm. When we're born again, is there a flash of light when there's you know how you say um, let me ask you this do you have to have revelation in order to, to come to Jesus you can't come unless the father draw you so that's, the light. that's the light when I realize I need a savior that's the flash of light Well, most of us don't recognize it as such, but it doesn't change the fact. Like most of us were not there when we were, when we were conceived. <laughs> we, we didn't see that flash of light. <laughs> but it came anyway, didn't it? Okay? It's essential that church planters recognize that new gatherings need womb time before it can, a new gathering needs womb time before it can actually be called a church. Womb time is a protected time. I think we would not lose near as many new converts if we, as a church, recognize they need womb time. Many local gatherings need to hear the Spirit of God say to them, you must be born again so, 
with all that's happened? Yes. Has CMC been born again? I think it's in the process. It's, a, it's at least in the process of maturing in the womb. See, w w listen for a moment. Just think about it. Okay, but this is my other question before you go there. <laughs> She's having fun. When did, con when did conception take place and we had a flash of light? That was... Yeah. I'm not sure we know. If God would reveal that event to us, we would know. But just like in the natural, we don't know when we're conceived. The same is true in the spirit. Okay. That flash of light that we receive individually that causes us to be conceived in the spirit is the revelation, I need a savior. And a receiving of that. I think there's there's been a realization in the house, we need something. <laughs> this thing is not going right. It's not happening right. It's not uh, balanced. There, there's something wrong. It may have been when we begin to realize that before the big kerfluffle, when we begin to realize that something was wrong and we needed to cry out to God more, that may well have been the point where the church was reconceived. But I don't know unless God tells me. I may have been there, but I wasn't there. All right. But those are excellent questions. In the natural, by the end of the third month, the little body is only about three inches long and recognizably human. Many organs are almost complete along with muscles, nerves, and reflexes. Although there's a shape and form at this, this time, the bones have not yet begun to solidify. So as intercessors, we need to know when conception took place so that we can pray into a healthy environment, a healthy womb? I am absolutely convinced conception has taken place. Okay. Okay. We need to pray, and we're going to talk about the different things that we need to pray into. Okay. Uh, because it, the bones are not made first. And we've tried to run things by doctrine. Guess what? That hasn't worked. It's produced what I call a crustacean. Crustacean has a shell on the outside and can't grow beyond the size of its shell. We're talking about the body at large. We're not talking about individuals. How do we how do we how do we separate how do we separate I mean individuals in the body? Which are you talking about? The body. You're not talking about individuals. Talking well, about first of all, let's let's for a moment talk about individuals. We go through this process as an individual. Our spirit is formed, and it's not as easy to see that process as it is to see it in a larger body. Okay, but it must go through. The body must go through this. It's called organic as opposed to structural. And what we're talking about, the reason we're talking about the womb time is because the body grows organically, not structurally. The structure doesn't come till after three months in the womb. And we've tried to put the structure in place and then put the body around it. How many of you can see my structure? See my bones? They're covered. They're in the invisible realm. Are you hearing me? And we have tried to make our doctrine visible. Without looking at where it is first. Without, without looking at that this is an organic thing, it is not a structural thing. Structure will evidence itself. But it doesn't come at first. Okay. 
Now, translating this into the realm of, of the spirit, we find that the, the, the doctrines of which the bones are one, or the bones are one type of the bones is doctrine. The doctrine are not the first things to be to form. The organs are very near completion. The muscles functioning as well, are functioning well, and the nerve system is also in place. Each of these speak of relationship rather than doctrine. Okay? And if I cannot overemphasize that he calls us the body of Christ. And yet we've never studied the body to see what this is spiritual reality is supposed to be. God first works in us to bring about the most essential to life. This is what this is what's formed first in the womb. Our heart. Why? Because out of it are the issues of life. Our kidneys, called reins in scripture, they are the restrainings of God through the pricking of our conscience. Psalm 73 verse 21 says, Thus my heart was grieved and I was pricked in my reins. Our brain with which we begin to put on the mind of Christ. We have got to learn to think from heaven down, not from earth up. And God is showing us how to think from heaven down. By the way, it, it's a totally different perspective. As it is in heaven. Yeah, not as it is on earth, so be it in heaven. Just let me, I love this aside, okay? We all know what's called the Lord's Prayer, which is really the disciples' prayer. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. How many have gotten the concept from the way things are preached that there's going to be more in hell than there is in heaven? That's not true. Only one-third of the angels fell, not two-thirds. His will is going to be done on earth as it is in heaven. That should give us great hope for what's coming. But it also needs to give us the seriousness. Lord, get us ready to be able to handle all these and to bring them in properly to see them, to catch all the fish and keep them, not to throw them out or not to lose them through holes in the net. Then the pancreas, that which keeps the blood sugar balanced or the principle of balance comes first if we let God do it. Our problem is we, we think we know what balance is. One day the Lord said, I'm the only one that's ever been balanced. So I'm the only one who knows how knows balance. Our lungs form though not functioning and we're going to talk about that more later. In other words, he gives us and makes us and develops in us that which will cause us to breathe in another dimension. Okay? Our muscles, according to Hebrews 5.14, they are our spiritual senses who have their senses exercised to what? Discern good and evil. So there's a whole teaching on discernment that would talk about our muscles needing to be exercised. It's also interesting that at this time the gender of the baby is not known. This could denote that there is a space and period in our walk with God when we do not know the purpose for which God has called us. Some people live in that place. Their whole life has been that place. Because they weren't taught that they can know the will of God. Hmm? So they don't have an identity. They don't have an identity. Because I don't know what God calls me. I know what the devil calls me. They're, they're, those are not good names. <laughs> but I, see, I can't walk with God unless I agree with him. Is that true? Can two walk together except to be agreed? How many know God's not going to change his mind? So I have to find out what he thinks about me and align myself with his thoughts. 
By the way, he thinks a lot more of me than I do. All right. In the third and fourth months, the bones begin to grow or become more solid. The shape of the face becomes more pronounced as the cartilage develops. The ribs and the vertebrae appear as well as the bones forming fingers and toes. Now listen to this carefully. The bones grow within the muscles. They don't start at the joints and grow. They start in the muscle and grow out to the joints. This speaks that spiritual bones or doctrine begin to grow and solidify after many other areas are formed and shaped. We are so concerned about doctrine that we don't let God do his work. We're inside out. Pardon me? We're inside out. We're in, again, yeah, we think from the mind up instead of from heaven down. So, so was was that? That's what happened to Adam. That's what, what happened, happened to Adam when he wanted. Okay, I don't have to explain it. I don't know that I can, but that's. You shall be as gods, knowing. The temptation was over what I know as to over what I experience. And all this happened. Do you all this is a result of the fall. So we're inside out. We're inside out. So how can our congregations be anything but inside out? That's what, what the work of God is right now, to bring us to a reality that sees the spiritual as the most important. Not just something we attend on Sunday or Thursday night or Saturday morning, but something where we think all of our circumstances are looked at in the light of heaven. I live from eternity. I remember be, having an experience in God where God said to me, time in your life, time is no more. I said, what in the world does that mean? He said, I do not want you to think about time. I want you to think about eternity and do it from eternity's perspective. Okay? How many know that changed my whole way of thinking? God first forms the vital organs that have to do with relationship with the head, the heart, the reins or kidneys, the balance, and makes provision for the moving in the new realm of the spirit before doctrine begins to form and grow. We've had it all backwards. We are the template for the body of Christ. Our body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. In a greater way we're seeing this than we ever did before. Consider this in John 7:17. 7, if any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. Catch this. Obedience to his voice produces an experiential knowledge of doctrine beyond the academic. In the past, we predicated doctrine from the academic study of Scripture. What's that got us? Argument, fighting, pride. division, pride, all of those things that, just in case you don't know, are not godly. This is what got the Pharisees in trouble. Their extensive study of the letter without the Spirit caused them to become literalists and legalists, producing a rigidity in doctrine based on the letter, not the principle. This rigidness wounded the people. I was tempted to go, there's some ice cubes in the freezer there. I was tempted to get some and throw them at you and say, have the word. <laughs> Well, if I did that, you could get wounded and cut by the ice cubes. But it's the washing of water by the word, not by the ice cubes. The word is not to be rigid. The word, any water you have takes the shape of the vessel you pour it into. <laughs> so 
So God is pouring the word in you. What shape is it going to take? Shape of you. If we took that bottle there and poured color in it, okay, you would see the shape of the water. Each of you are a different shape. I'm not speaking physically now. I'm speaking spiritually. <laughs> and the word that God gives you is to be the shape of you. That's why he doesn't only cause us to read the Logos, he speaks Rhema into us. And the Rhema adjusts the uniqueness of who we are. The Logos is the same no matter where you read it. But the Rhema is the, the word of application, the commandments that God gives. He said, if any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine. So God is saying, I want you to experience doctrine. We're saying, I want to know, know doctrine before I experience it. I don't know uh, how many of you know of Richard Wombrandt. Spent 13 years in Romanian prisons. I sat in meetings with him one point, and I just, I just wept. And the Lord said to me, he is mature beyond his theology. That's quite a statement. He carried such an awesome presence of God. He's told me that Richard Wombrandt, the experience, the experiencing of the word, forms the doctrine of God within us. Faith is the... Oh, you mean each time I walk in faith, I obtain substance. An illustration of that is Exodus. Is it Exodus uh, 34? Or Exodus where the elders went up to the mountain with, with Moses, and it says they saw God as the body of heaven in his clearness. In other words, they saw shape and form, but they didn't see any features. But in the book of Revelation, what do you see? There's a man upon the throne. What is and what made the difference? Jesus came down, became the word made flesh, and the experiencing of that relationship with God gave him substance, and he took substance into eternity. That's our journey. That substance, you know, mm -hmm. I'm always thinking about mathematics or <laughs> physics or something, and it's like, the substance, faith, it's like having momentum, right? It's like having weight that once, once you put, what is it, once wow. you put something in motion. Body in motion tends to remain in motion. A body at rest, which is like most of the church. No, I mean, uh, <laughs> tends to remain at rest. It's called the law of inertia. Okay. But people, there are people that experience the... Please, don't forget we have a few folks online. There are people that experientially walking through the word that becomes real to them And they've been ridiculed for. Yes. Ridiculed for. Ridiculed for. One of the outstanding, I mean, Richard Wombrandt's one of the outstanding men uh, who experienced God in just absolutely awesome. And 
both he and his wife carried a presence of God that was un, un, uh, uh, undescribable. And we had her stay in our house. Uh, but then another one is Brother Yun from China. Have you ever heard him called the Heavenly Man? It's interesting to read that book because um, I met him several times. But he, his dad was, his mother used to work for a, a Christian elder before Miao Zedong took over. Of course, after Miao Zedong took over, she distanced herself because she wanted to live. So the husband uh, got um, cancer and they sent him home with basically two weeks to die. And she remembered. The elder said, if we pray in Jesus' name, that Jesus would heal. That's all she remembered. So they gathered, the family gathered around the bed, and she just prayed a very simple prayer. In Jesus' name, heal him. The next morning, he hadn't eaten in weeks. Next morning, he woke up hungry, sat up in bed, and he was healed. So they all turned to this Jesus who could heal. That's all they knew. Some of the stuff they went through was absolutely awesome. One of the things they would go, they would go out and preach about the Jesus who could heal. And people would accept the Jesus who could heal. And then they talked about the holy dragon. And the, the Holy Spirit. They, oh, they didn't know the terms. They didn't have a Bible. But they did the will of God and they knew God and God led them, gave them scriptures, got them a Bible. One night he's, he had a dream. He saw some men coming to the door and knocking on his door and, and with a Bible. So the, someone knocked on the door and he's yelled through the door, do you have my Bible? He experienced God and preached the experience and God straightened out his doctrine. We have got to begin to experience God because once we experience God, there's no doubt left. Brother Jung became the head of one of the three major underground churches in China. And then God got him out of there. Interesting enough, a German man walked up to him. Well, I got to tell this story. Um, but he was in prison. Both legs were broken. Both ankles were broken. And one of the Christians came in, in on his way out of the cell to be tortured, turned to him and said, you're going to escape today. He said, I can't escape. I can't walk. So he got in the cell and the Lord said, stand on your feet. He said, Lord, I can't stand on my feet. The Lord said, stand on your feet. So he pushed himself back to the bed, got up on the edge of the bed, and pulled himself up on his feet, and his feet were healed. The Lord said, now, and he's on the fourth floor. There are guards at every door. There's guards at the door of his cell. He walked past the guard to his cell. The guard didn't see him. He walked down four flights of stairs with a guard at every level. They didn't see him. When he got down there, the door opened. When the door opened, the gate opened. There was a taxi out there. And he ran out and got in the taxi and got away. Because he obeyed God, he saw the hand of God. And he was able to go back and read scripture and apply what he learned from the scripture. Right. Because he didn't have a Bible for a, a few months anyway of preaching and getting people saved by the Jesus who heals. Folks, we're the ones with the problem. You know how many people are spiritually constipated? <laughs> <laughs> because we've been taught the opposite. Right. All right, let's get back to the course. We need time. Okay. Wow. This got the Pharisees in trouble. Their extensive study of the letter without the spirit, they became literalists and legalists producing a rigidity in doctrine based on the letter, not on principle. This rigid, rigidness wounded people. 
This is a danger of putting academic study above experiencing the applied will of God. First, Colossians 1 and 9 says, we can know the full will of God for our life as individuals and for our assembly. It's not enough to know it about me. I need to know it for the assembly and find out from God where I fit and where I'm to function. Doing the will of God is placed before doctrine. Doctrine is important, but it seems that we can only experientially know the truth of doctrine by doing the will. When a child is formed in the womb, although the bones are there, there's a pliability and flexibility that aids in it being born. If the bones were rigid, the baby would tear up the mother on its way out. That's why the, the, your head has plates. You ever see a cone-shaped baby? <laughs> it's because the plates made way. They came together and almost made an arrow and made way down through the, the birth canal. There's a flexibility in the mind that must remain there. Too much rigidity would cause the, cause the bones to break during the birth process because the baby is bigger than the canal. So what's the, spiritual reality? the spiritual reality is when we are being born, there's some things that go on, and we're going to touch on that. I call it the stress of being born again. And it's not the stress on the mother. We know a lot about that. What about the stress on the child? Okay, doing the will of God is placed before doctrine. Doctrine, uh, let me go down. If all of the above is true, the natural child in the womb and the individual being formed in God, how much more is it true when the principles are applied to God forming an assembly? Although the doctrine is important within a local church, other things must be formed first. When they have to, they have to do with relationship with the head and the other members of the body. From these and within these, where it is necessary, doctrine grows from the center of the experience, not from the edge of it. Again, pointing to what what the uh, medical books call the ossification centers. Your bones go from the center of your muscle out to the joint which is exactly opposite of what we think, okay? Just shortly after the bone centers begin to grow, it becomes evident that what the child's gender is. In the realm of the individual, we could say there begins to be evidence in them of the direction of their call and purpose. During the fifth month, there is an obvious knowing of the baby, a time when the mother begins to feel the movement of the baby within. The baby moves and kicks and begins to be large enough to crowd some things within the mother, making her uncomfortable. In the words of another, it's the time of the quickening. This is evidently a beginning to recognize the witness of the Spirit. My greatest illustration of that in scripture is John the Baptist in Elizabeth's womb. I call the, the witness of the Spirit that yes within. You may not understand it, what's being said or what's being imparted, but something inside says yes. The baby leaps in the womb. That truth leaps in your inner being. In the individual, we find that this movement of the spiritual seed begins to make the flesh of man uncomfortable. In the natural, there begins to be a greater looking towards being delivered from that which is growing inside. Why? Because things inside are getting uncomfortable. 
Are there some things in you getting uncomfortable? Is there something being ready to birth, be birthed in you in your realm of your spirit? In our spiritual experience, we find that the flesh would like to get rid of the spiritual life or even the ministry within. The fullness of time has not yet come, and things continue to get more uncomfortable. And we rebuke the devil, and he doesn't go because he isn't there. The uncomfortableness is God's way of saying, I'm doing something in you. 1 Peter 5 and 6 says, Humble yourself, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in nine spiritual months. I mean, in due time. There is a process that cannot be hurried. And every stage of this, it may not take a long time, but the process must be gone through. In God, it has, linear time has no no attachment. It's how long it takes that word to happen. How long that word is formed and shaped in you until birth. This is a principle that needs to be understood. It applies to every phase of our spiritual growth and development. As in the natural, the baby will not come before its time unless something goes wrong. The same is true in spiritual development. We try and stretch people rather than have the growth come within, from within. We see a call on someone's life. We push them instead of let it develop organically. Isn't that dangerous? Isn't that dangerous? That is dangerous. That could produce an abortion, a spiritual abortion of the principle that God's working on or the ministry God's working on in that life. We're going to talk later on about stillbirth, uh, miscarriages, abortions, all of those things and their spiritual realities because we have been doing this in one sense. We are as, we are as guilty of abortion as the world is right now spiritually. We have aborted many things in God. And we haven't realized it because we didn't know the principles. If we let something grow organically, if we let the Spirit of God take his time in developing a ministry, a person, a church, or whatever, we're likely to get something very healthy in the end. But we try and push it. You know, I'm, this is dangerous, and as a professor and head of a school, I can say this, okay, in education. But we have educated people so that their education overtakes their spirituality. And that aborts the purpose of God in them. About this, I'm, I'm wondering... <clears throat> The early church, the very early church, seemed to be very effective in changing the world. Mm -hmm. And then it became Roman, the Roman influence. Right. And everything came to a screeching halt. All the house church, everybody functioning, all, you know, everybody having a role in the church. And then only this one guy up there who's Roman who may not even be born again. Everybody else sits and watches. And we've been sitting and watching ever since, mm -hmm. the one guy functioning. So is it possible that that early church that Jesus birthed was functioning in the way we're talking about, but that we got lost in all of the... I would like to believe that, but when I look at the book of Ephesians, I see that it never fully functioned in the early church. And it was the first one to go into apostasy. Ephesians, if you read Revelation 2, it's the first one addressed. And he said, you've lost your first love. It was the love for the Lord and the love for the brethren. If I may say so, by the time we get to Ephesians, it's very Roman influence, not just the original Jewish one. And maybe I'm 
I'm just wondering if, well, I mean, well what I'm saying. It's the, the influence that came that caused the dissension and caused the well, confusion and whatever it is. I'm just wondering. Uh, see, if we will deal with what is within, God will bring forth what he promised. And what we see in the early church, especially, you know, later on, is a desire to escape persecution and not be rejected. And because we didn't deal with our stuff, we succumbed. He says you're tempted when you're drawn away of what? Oh, not somebody else's? It's me. It's what's in me that draws me aside, if the scripture is true. Okay? So, I, I believe Ephesians was prophetic of the end time. Because it says that until you all come, he wasn't a southerner, but until you all come in the unity of the faith to the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man. That was prophetic. It never happened in the early church. Therefore, Ephesians was not fully expressed in the early church. It was prophetic for the end time. Okay? Well, that clears up a lot, actually. Pardon me? That clears up a lot. Yes. Yeah. We, you know, the dark ages were essential. Whether we like it or not, they were essential. Because we had to follow some of Israel's, old Israel's pattern till we come to the point where our desperation is for God and God alone. Okay? And we're going to see that. There's going to come forth the people that are so desperate for God, they don't care what it takes. They're going to pursue it. That was the Davidic heart of David. That's the tabernacle of David being restored. Okay? Does that help? You can't hurry God. You just have to trust him and give him time. He's a God that you can't hurry. He'll be there, so don't you worry. He may not come when you want him, but he's right on time. We sang that in Bible school. But that is so true. We have tried to hurry God in these types of things. And so we have denomination after denomination after denomination. Now, God's going to use all those in the end time, every one of them that was birthed in God is going to use a measure of the revelation that they received. But you cannot hurry God. In the fullness of time, God brought forth. And here's the definition God gave me. The fullness of time is when the process of time has done its work. Okay. How would we know? Hmm? How would we know? We, we know because he's the one that declares it's finished. In any area of your life, in his dealings, he declares when you come to the end of that dealing, he says, it is finished. I've been too busy to hear it. Okay? Go ahead. I'm speaking personally, but also from talking to other people. But we just seem to be in a time, maybe it's this congregation, maybe it's all together, crazy world, of conflicts that we didn't anticipate in the spirit realm. And I, I, I don't know, just a, is this because God is instituted, instigating these things to get us to the place of putting aside all the things that we thought were a good idea? And, I see the look on your face. I'm just going to wait till you finish. <laughs> you, you're, you're on one of my hobby horses. <laughs> Let's ride this together for a few minutes. We have been through our Egyptian time. We have been through our wilderness time. Where God works with us to take the welfare mentality out of us. And the slave mentality out of us. We are coming to our promised land. The problem in the promised land is everything you get, you get by warfare. But the declaration before 
you go into the promised land, it's Moses, my one-man ministry, I mean, my servant is dead. And we come to the Jordan, which is a type of the flesh. And God, God deals with the, the, the flesh all the way back to Adam. That's the promise of the promised land. God is going to deal with the Adamic nature. He's going to deal with sin. Sin will have no more dominion over us. Not only that, but sin is a nature that can be eradicated, according to Scripture. So it sounds like what it means is there's a paradigm shift coming. We are in a paradigm. Yes. We're in the transition. That we, we're about at the end of the 30 days of mourning for Moses, the one-man ministry. God is going to say, okay, prepare ye vittles for three days. Do you realize God caused manna to last for three days? Because that's all the vittles they had. Pack a lunch of manna. But wait a minute. Yesterday, I had some left over and it went to worms. So God does something sovereign to be able to feed us as we are in the transition of moving into the promised land. Everything we get in the promised land is by warfare. That's what we're experiencing. That warfare we didn't expect because nobody taught us. We want the promises of God, but nobody taught us it's gotten by warfare. Okay? That's another one of my hobby horses. Let me get back here on this subject. That's true. Oh, my God. Yeah. Okay? So is that why all of a sudden... Is that why all of a sudden... Is that why all of a sudden it seems like ministry is being removed because it was a one man God is going to remove all those who will not allow themselves to be blended in to the corporate ministry we don't really know what the corporate ministry looks like but every man has a song and the word song right right <laughs> but I think we're starting to move into that. Yes, we are. Right? We are. We are living in the most momentous days that have ever been in the church. I've okay. had um, some really good experiences. Oh, <clears throat> I've had some really good experiences of visiting different types of churches and their different ministries like one of them is good at one thing and one of them is good at something else and, one of them is, mm -hmm. and it's almost like if you could put them all together we're, we're going to talk about some of that and why that's so because we have got to allow for other expressions yeah. and other emphasis what we've not done is allow for that and we wanted everyone to look like us. Yeah. We wanted to clone them rather than them be organic. Okay? It's also true when God is dealing to remove something in our lives that is inhibiting his life in us. Each of them have a specific time in God to be either dealt with or manifest. Anything before that time is an abortion or miscarriage. In the local assembly, we often feel a quickening or try to rush what God is producing. We get a prophetic word and we think it's to happen immediately. And so we think of a way that we can make it happen. And we produce an abortion or a miscarriage. Something before it's time. That's what a miscarriage is. Something being birthed before it's time. And some of them survive and some of them don't. 
What God is doing is not yet fully developed, shaped, or formed. If it is brought forth before its time, it may not live or produce life. Just as a baby brought forth before its time might not survive, even with special care and great expense, the church, ministry, or purpose of God being formed in a person, ministry, or church might die if we try and bring it before its time. Pardon? Yes? Or? Yeah. Distorted with distorted thinking. That which was being formed may look good, have the right shape and form, and have all that's needed to function, but it is premature because the pressure and atmosphere have not done their full work. That God, that which God was forming dies, a spiritual abortion. Wow. Hmm? Okay, that which was being formed may look good, may have the right shape and form, and have all that is needed to function, but if it is premature, because the pressure and atmosphere have not done their full work, that which God was forming dies a spiritual abortion. I've seen a good many of those down through the years. Because the pressure and atmosphere have not done their full work. The pressure within, the pressure within, how many know that, I mean, just ask the woman who's carrying the baby. There's, your skin is only a certain level of elasticity. But that pressure does a work on the child. Okay? And the atmosphere of being in the immersed in the word, I mean the water, does a work. That connection to heaven through the umbilical cord does a work. Are you catching this? Okay. I'm not sure that any have survived in the realm of the spirit. They may look alive, act like there's life, but, they, but there is a weakness in their spiritual system, just as there is in the system of a natural, premature child. Many premature babies have breathing problems. They can't breathe the ratified air of the spirit. Remember that when you're birthed out of the womb, you're birthed into a totally different atmosphere. The process of birth, much has been written from the perspective of the, of the natural mother. Consider the perspective of the child with reference to the relative truths concerning the mother or the church being used of God to birth either a ministry or another church. In the natural. When I was pregnant with my boys, I used to speak to them all the time. Right. I even called them by their name. Right. In the spirit. <laughs> what do you think prophetic word is? Speaking of something before its time, it is speaking to the baby of the ministry, of a church, of a person's life, of a person's purpose that has not yet been born. Okay, so that's what you just said is very dangerous. Could you repeat it? <laughs> Let me rewind the tape. <laughs> The prophetic word. Remember that Proverbs says, without a vision, the people perish. One translation says, without prophetic vision or prophetic revelation, the people cast off all restraint. Your vision restrains you. Okay? So, when we speak prophetically into a person's life, 
of their ministry, of their purpose, their call of God. We're speaking to the baby that God is birthing and the baby that God is forming within. That is essential. That's why prophetic word is absolutely essential. And I'm pushing as gently as I can for the prophetic word to flow in this place. Because it is absolutely essential to the life of the body and what God is doing. I finally understood what okay. you said. I've had prophetic words over me. But I didn't realize till now. But it was in a womb. First of all, we have come in, you and I have come into the time when many of those prophetic words are going to be fulfilled. The reason God put us on earth is coming into our lives. I'm a little slow learner. I'm 77, just starting this thing, okay? But, if God, he that hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. In other words, he has begun, he's going to finish it. All I need to do is say, yes, Lord. Okay. He supplies everything I need to come into what he's prophesied concerning me. So we don't have to worry about all this. If, if I will obey God day by day, I'll come into the fullness of all he's promised. <laughs> I've got a lot trying to <coughs> So really all of this boils down to if we just stay in our own lane and we just connect with God for ourselves instead of trying to focus where do I fit in here or there or everywhere else and just allow him to do what needs to be done in me instead of trying to get a step ahead or trying to figure out what he's doing in a certain I know I'm being <laughs> I just transparency I have a big problem in myself with trying to be because um, my growth was in a place of teaching and and I'm very thankful for that but my experiences and the way that I've tried to process is through how can I teach this and I feel like it's caused a very large hindrance because instead of just realizing that I'm in a womb because a baby can't teach anything a baby just needs to receive and grow and mature in that process um, I don't know. I feel like I'm still st I'm I'm listening to all this and going, I'm stuck. And no. You're not stuck. Because you are growing. See, what we've had is lots of teaching but very little impartation. I'm crying out to God, let the words I speak be spirit and life. Let them impart the substance of what I'm trying to say and the substance of what you're trying to say into their spirit. Because if it gets into your spirit, it's going to work its way out. 
All I have to do is align with God's promise. God, you said this. I'm going to stay doing what I'm doing because you're not telling me to turn to the right hand or to the left. I'm going to stay doing what I'm doing, trusting that you will and obey you today, trusting that by the time I get to that which you've promised me, I'll be ready for it. You know, a lot of what God is doing is testing our trust. And people become spiritually obese because of just the word, but not experiencing it or releasing it. We'll talk about that later on, but the short answer is yes. And we got a lot of fat cats in the church. The fat cells in the natural are to store food for release to the rest of the body. When I'm on the take all the time and never giving out, I can become cancerous. You have a question, Lonnie? There I'm going, to, I'm going to speak to Debbie over there, but um, just from my own perspective, I came to a place, real crisis in the last couple of weeks, <clears throat> really confused. And it came to a place where I had to just stop saying whatever it is. I mean, it's true when I teach this class, but we're just going to talk about I'm having a conversation. It's not like I'm going to be the teacher, because I don't know what God wants to teach right now on a lot of levels except that it fits in with what you're saying. So I think we don't have to figure out, we just babies don't figure out what they're supposed to do. And so we're, we've been made to put back into a place of resting in him mm -hmm. and just letting him grow us into whatever it is. Because we've been trying to be whatever we think ministry is. And, and um, so... This is a relief, really. Mm -hmm. All right. The basis of the next paraphrases come from the Scientific American, April 1986, pages 100 to 107. The journey through the birth canal and its accompanying stress is not normally harmful to infants. How much do we try and avoid stress? David said, when I was in distress, thou didst enlarge me. Stress is the enlarging tool of God. First of all, to make more room for him. Second of all, yeah, growing pains. Yep. Okay. It releases stress hormones that surge through the system that are important to the baby's survival in its new environment. There is a stress that God allows and is necessary to prepare us for the new environment. David said in the Psalms that distress was the enlarging tool of God. Psalm 4 and verse 1, hear me when I call. That's not a nice, hey God, are you there? I think that's a cry. Hear me when I call, O God, of my righteousness. Thou hast enlarged me when I was in distress. Have mercy on me and hear my prayer. Psalm 118, verse 5. I called upon the Lord in distress, and the Lord answered me, and what? Set me in a large place. You mean I have to go through the stress to get to the large place? Don't look so excited. <laughs> See, we, we don't understand the dealings of God, therefore we fret things that we need to trust him in. Stress is crucial to the life of the child, triggering within it that which will allow it to function in the new environment. In the life of the individual Christian, stress is indispensable 
so that the preparatory work can go on. Pardon me? Sort of given the idea that you should just be peaceful all the time. I was told that, well, you just got to be happy and be peaceful in Jesus, yeah. you know. And, and, and yet, in all honesty, when you read the Old Testament and the saints of old, can you find them without stress? So they're so almost like you're saying, are you almost saying there's a good form of stress? Yes. 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 It's the enlarging tool of God. This causes us to cry out to God that his life and anointing go to that which speaks of the vital areas of our relationship with him and keep us alive. In the stress of being born, the blood leaves the extremities and goes to the vital organs. Many churches refuse to go through stress and become stillborn. We have just been through stress. And it has brought the church together. That's a good sign. Press down, shaken, together. And then comes the running over. But without the first two, you're not going to get the last one. All those things within us are supplied with all that is necessary during the stress of being birthed or born into the new realm. Consider this. It's important to take time with these truths. It's important to pray into them and find out where God is birthing something new in us and aligning ourselves with God's purpose for that. The dealings of God bring us to, into new dimensions, realms of God, and our understanding of parallels are essential to our maturity. They also parallels to the birthing processes. This, this happens in our individual lives, but we've got to realize that God is birthing new things in us all the time. And that new truth will go through this process. Remember this, okay? When my wife and I have children, the children have the DNA of both of us, which produces a brand new DNA. Why don't we apply that to the things of God in our local assemblies? If God is birthing something new, it will not look the same as any other, even, you know, even twins have differences. Okay? We've got to begin to let God be God. Stop trying to shape and form ourselves or form others in their, in their womb experience. Therefore, taking our time to understand this is vital. So let's talk to Father. Lord Jesus, as we continue, would you give us hearing ears and seeing eyes. Create them with each new truth that we might hear, be converted, and be saved from not grasping these realities spiritually. From what not grasping these realities spiritually could subject us to. We thank you for the illustration that you've given in the natural process that we can understand the process of being born again. We give you permission to work with us extensively that we might be born from faith to faith into grace upon grace and from glory to glory. Father, thank you. Thank you for not just the teaching, but for the discussion. Lord, would you take and apply these things to our lives, these truths, that we might become expressions of the truth, not just academic knowers of it. Lord, would you birth in this a congregation, in this body of people, in those listening here, the new things that you want to reveal to your church and you want to manifest through your church, we pray, in your precious name. And everybody said...
Amen.